So it's my pleasure to welcome our two speakers today. Peter uh, Vanworth is an epidemiologist for the Benton County Health Department and the Lynn Benton and Lincoln County's Regional Health Assessment. He has a master's in statistics from Stanford and a master's in mathematics from Oregon State. And in his free time, he enjoys gardening, cooking, and playing music with his family. And with him is Ruby Kiker, who's a new member of the Regional Health Assessment team and a recent, very recent graduate from our MPH program here with concentration in international health. Um, her time in the MPH program was inspired and informed by her service as a United States uh, Peace Corps volunteer in Swaziland, where she, along with her husband, focused on community health education. And she's also an instructor here at OSU and teaches uh, a global public health course. So um, let's make them welcome, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Um, so this talk kind of grew out of discussions between our previous project coordinator, Lauren Zimbelman, and Marie Harvey, just as an opportunity to give the College of Public Health a little bit of background into what our project has been doing for the last just over a year. Um, so today, we're going to talk about the landscape of community health in Lynn Benton and Lincoln counties, with a focus kind of on changes in the recent years and on the health assessment. Uh, if at any time you have trouble seeing or you can't hear, just let me know. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. I don't know that we have a solid 50 minutes of presentation that you'll have to sit to, through, so we should have time for questions uh, as a presentation goes along. So today we're going to cover a little bit about the history of regional community health, the CCOs, and public health accreditation, which are two major changes in the landscape in the last five years or so. Then Ruby's going to talk about the regional health assessment. We'll talk a little bit about our model and the report and the data warehouse that we're putting together this year. We're going to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities we've run into of doing community health assessment in the region. Um, Ruby will talk a little bit about a health perception survey that we're launching in the next month. And if we have time, I've got some examples of analyses I've done using regional data. And we can talk about some of those kind of astounding topics. Let's jump right in. So um, the way I kind of built in my head this slide is thinking of community health as providers and insurers who provides a service who pays for the service. And so major providers in the region include social service agencies like Community Services Consortium, the County Health Departments, Samaritan Health Services being the largest uh, health provider, and other clinics like Corvallis Clinic and some others that I'm sure I'm not aware of because I don't have a deep background in who's providing health. To go along with the major providers are the major insurers, which include public insurance like Oregon Health Plan and Medicare, private insurance, and Samaritan Health Plan, which I'm calling out really because in the next slide, um, the next couple slides, you'll see how it links in. And um, at the time, in the history of community health, Samaritan Health Plans uh, had a lot of private insurance, and it also worked with OHP to provide uh, health insurance for Medicaid members. So you all, you probably know more about healthcare information than I do, but here's my take on it and how it relates specifically to our work. Um, beginning in 2012, the Oregon Health Authority partnered with Center for Medicaid and Medicare to do a, a transformation using the coordinated care model. Um, 2013, Intercommunity Health Network, which was Samaritan's, one of Samaritan's health plans, became their regional coordinated care organization for Lynn Benton and Lincoln counties. Uh, kind of at the same time, Benton Lynn and Lincoln Public Health Departments decided to apply for public health accreditation. Then in 2014, when the Affordable Care Act was implemented, OHP enrollment swelled greatly, which really put the impetus behind the CCOs. And in this year, um, we're really focusing on building regional partnerships and assessment data and uh, coordinated care. Any questions about this? Did I miss anything really important? This is what my little view of this has been. So, part two, history of the 
community health in the region. The major change here is, well, I would say that uh, the major providers, even though they were overlapped, the goal is to make those <coughs> intersections much stronger and much tighter. And then in terms of paying for care, public insurance and American health plans came together and created IHNCCO, <coughs> which is how we refer to it in the community health network, so I probably won't say that again. It's called IHN. So this is kind of the landscape of community health right now. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the goals of the CCO reforms, and again, this is in the context of what we're doing, so probably a lot of people here have specialized in that sort of understanding that I don't have, and that's okay with me. Um, this is from Bill Bushka, who is a health authority innovator agent at the state. So the goals include taking fra fragmented care and turning it into coordinated patient-centered care. Take disconnect connected funding streams that have unsustainable growth and bring them into a global budget with a fixed rate of growth. Take volume payment with no incentives for improving health, fee for service basically, and turn it into capitated payment with quality incentives. So the CCOs get a chunk of money based on the number of OHP enrollees and maybe a projection of how that might grow over the coming year. That's the money they have to work with. They get to keep any extra that they don't pay on services. And if they meet quality incentives, they get um, a reserve of money that was held back as an incentive. From limits on services, the goal is to turn that into flexible services. From healthcare delivery disconnected from population health to community health assessments and improvement plans that are built with community input. And from limited community voice and local partnerships to community advisory council and local partnerships, limited versus no longer limited. So we would qualify as one of the local partnerships, I would say. IHN in particular, which is our local CCO, provides managed care to OHP members, Lynn Bend, Lincoln counties. It currently, as of I think I looked that up in November. In November, it had about 57,500 members, um, which is 93% of all OHP enrollees in Lynn, Benton, and Lincoln counties. Lane County CCO cuts into Southern Lynn a little bit. I think um, IHN cuts into Southern Polk. So there's a little bit of overlap county to county. Covers physical, mental, and dental care. And it has a large pot of funding to support community health projects beyond just paying for health care service. All right, so here are some of the regional partners that I've learned about, I've discovered in my, I've been with the Regional Health Assessment for about seven months total, so I haven't been here very long, but I've already seen a lot more than I ever knew existed. I attend CCO has a work group called Delivery System Transformation. They have a community advisory council, which is made up of community members from Lynn, Benton, and Lincoln counties. Half of the membership needs to be OHP members. Um, and then they have a healthy communities work group with, whose job is really to kind of coordinate a lot of the work that goes on over here and make sure everybody talks to each other. The county health departments have federally qualified health centers. Um, All C Rural Clinic is now going to be working with Benton County, Lynn, Benton, qualified health center, and they're also opening a new center in Sweet Home, so they're actually expanding pretty quickly. And then the public health departments. The Community Services Consortium provides emergency housing that also runs the Lynn Benton Food Chair. There's also a Lincoln County Food Chair, which I don't think is necessarily under the CSC umbrella. And then there are a lot of other groups. Early Learning Hub, which is kind of the CCO model for children zero to six, focused on education. Willamette Neighborhood Housing, uh, one of their entities is the Lynn Benton Health Equity Alliance. Oregon Cascades West Council of Government. OSU, I realize the mic is over here. Uh, you guys, Samaritan Health Services, United Way. Um, so these are some of the regional partners that we've been talking to about our work. Think. Oh yeah, public health accreditation, the other big change. So um, this is a little timeline of how the counties and the state have gotten involved. Public health accreditation looks to set a national standard 
with just a ridiculous number of uh, very specific metrics that public health departments should meet in order to get nationally accredited by a nonprofit board. Lynn and Benton County started their process in uh, 2012. Lincoln started theirs in 2013. And um, accreditation is not limited to counties. It can be county, local, tribal, or state. And so the state of Oregon started theirs in 2014. As far as what public health accreditation entails, um, you start with a community health assessment, CHA. You use that to build a community health improvement plan by identifying priorities from the health assessment that the local public health department focuses on. The next step is to submit documentation to the public health accreditation board. Benton County submitted about 500 documents. Then in preparation for a site visit, the board says, well, we want another set of documents. So I think we're submitting something like another 150. Um, then they have a site visit where they kind of ask about the documents, look at the public health department, ask for more documents. Um, Benton County's is in January. Lynn County had their site visit. I think it was in July. Assuming all goes well, you get accredited. And then you immediately start preparing for the next cycle, which means gathering more documents, making a new CHAW, updating your chip, uh, preparing for the next site visit. And this all happens on a five-year cycle. So assuming Lynn and Benton and Lincoln counties all get accredited, then in 2017 and 2018, this whole thing will start again. Now it's time to turn it over to you. Could I ask a question about accreditation? Absolutely. So what is the, so the care is you get more opportunity for funding. Is that kind of the, yeah. the so, you don't have to be accredited. Right. right. So it's not required um, in order to get current level of funding that's in statute and things like that. Um, the carrots are more competitive for grant applications okay. and funding opportunities. You get to have that nice stamp say, you know, we're meeting the change in health care and public health. And it's likely that at some point in the future, it won't just be a bonus, but something like Ronald Bird Johnson Foundation may have a screen that's for accredited okay. health departments. Is it, is it likely, though, at some point to be required? Well, it's, um, I don't really know how these things work, and the ties between the nonprofit status of the board and like the counties are the, the state designated local health, public health officials. And yeah. so, we're required by state statute to provide these services. I don't know if at some point the state's going to say you can't do it anymore unless you're yeah. accredited. I doubt that. Yeah. Uh, that I, yeah, that's beyond what I do, fortunately. So I have another question about this. Yeah. The, uh, the state now going for accreditation. Mm -hmm. Is that happening at OHA or at the yeah, public health division, or where is it spearheaded? It's spearheaded up at the public health division. Okay. Um, and do they work with all of you who are also? Is it coordinated? Well, I don't know that they're asking us for documents. Okay. I, I think it's about the processes of the department. And so they're going to look at their internal documentation that they've done at the state public health division to say, we're meeting these metrics and meeting these standards. A lot of those may involve communication with the counties, but it's basically all going to be documents that they have, they collected, they stamped, and by a certain date. Okay. Thank and you for your question. Would you say you're like Benton County is the is the minority or the majority in terms of most accreditation, or are we say it's still rare? That's a great question. Um, I think there are there are four counties okay. in Oregon that are currently accredited. Okay. I couldn't name them all. Okay. There are okay. a bunch more that are seeking accreditation, okay. both in the county and elsewhere. So. Okay. Um, Lane County always likes to be first for yeah. public health, but we're not in this case, and that's great, and we're certainly not going to be last here. Thank you for your questions. Any others before I let Ruby talk a little more in detail about our health assessment? Okay, plenty of time for questions after. All right, so it was really these um, changes within the health system that spurred on the regional health assessment and why it was created. Um, before I talk about our work in, the, in our regional context, I wanted to just look at the assessment cycle. Um, so the data inform assessment cycle starts with, um, with uh, aggregating and gathering data um, and then analyzing that data. 
And then the data needs to go to the right people um, at the right time for them to be able to prioritize uh, their the health issues within their region. Um, once priorities have been identified, plans can be then made for interventions. And the measuring, um, measuring of the progress is really the only way that we can assess whether those interventions uh, or programs were successful. So um, there are many assessment cycles going on within Lynn, Benton, and Lincoln County. Uh, and that's really our region that we're focused on. Each county health department, like we just talked about, um, is doing a shock ship five-year cycle. And this follows, like we talked about, the, um, the best practices put forward by the Public Health Accreditation Board, which is a voluntary uh, program. Next, we have the coordinated care organizations. And they have their own shock ship cycle that also follows a five-year schedule. And this um, cycle is mandated by their community advisory council. Additionally, the hospitals have a similar process required by the IRS um, called Community Health Needs Assessment, or CHNA. And this is on a three-year cycle. And it's a way for the hospitals to show that they are um, have identified and are able to serve um, the population within their community. Additionally, uh, federally qualified health centers have a similar community health assessment cycle. And the Early Learning Home is another group that has assessment requirements. Um, and their data is based around um, health-related data for children in the community. Given that the county health departments are a big part of the CCO, um, what's the relationship between assessments at the county level and the uh, CCO assessment? Yeah, so that's a great question, and that's um, kind of another reason why we try to form this partnership within the RHA program or the project. Um, the, I know that the county level chips, CHAWS and CHIPS, have been used kind of as a starting point for the CCO, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, so they kind of identify those as a baseline and then look further into indicators that they want to include in their own challenge. Um, let's see. So yeah, the Early Learning Hub, and then additional partners, nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations, they have different reporting requirements and grant requirements as well. So the RHA, um, or the, the, the reason the RHA was formed um, because the, these partners really recognize the need for coordinated data um, across the region. And so the team was formed in 2014, late 2014, and began gathering and aggregating regional level data over the past year. Um, we will complete our initial community health assessment report by the end of this calendar year, and uh, planning has begun for year two. And I was actually, um, so I'm the project coordinator for the regional health assessment, and I wasn't a part of year one at all. I've just been part of the project for the last month. Mm -hmm. So um, Lauren Dimbleman, who started the project, uh, was really spearheading along with the rest of the team uh, the first year of this of the RHA. Um, so throughout the process, Process, partner collaboration, and long-term sustainability have really been a focus of the teams. Um, our partners are the ones that first recognized the need for coordinated data, and we really wanted to stay true to their vision. So of course, um, however, we're not operating in a political vacuum in the region, so there's, like we mentioned, all of these accreditation boards and laws and different requirements that go along with, with our work as well. So the health assessment itself is, um, our model includes five different components. And the first component is really uh, revolves around a responsive team, RHA team. Um, it's the cornerstone to our progress. 
and we really have a strong set of, of skills and intra-team co uh, cooperation that has made the first year really valuable. And I'm currently being a, uh, coming into that, that teamwork, so that's great. Um, secondly, our partners are really important, so we need a strong team, and then we need a really strong set of partners uh, to make this project possible. And the partners help to really steer our uh, planning and deliverables, and open communication has been really important for us. So by starting with relationships and communication, we've been able to provide the reports and the data that have been useful for our partners. And let's see, um, the data warehouse that, that Peter mentioned earlier has been set up um, and is evolving throughout the project. And this will really be a way for us to revisit data that, we're, that we have added into our reports and dig a little bit deeper into different areas that we want to look at or that other partners are interested in looking at. And this entire uh, project is um, governed by project management. And our team is really committed to sustainability and uh, replicability and continuous improvement, which has been uh, definitely a cornerstone. So we are really intent on documenting our processes and making sure we have um, internal timelines and cycles that we pay attention to. So we have six themes um, that we're looking at for our RHA report. The first, the first one is demographics, so we're looking at population, um, growth rates, race, age, um, and also consider considering important or sensitive subgroups um, that are you know, affected by public health, such as Native American populations, and individuals uh, with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness, etc. The next um, section is environment, which includes both the natural and built environment. And then we have social determinants of health, and we look at anything from education to um, food security and income. The fourth chapter, so each of these um, main topic areas are broken up into chapters in our reports. The next chapter is access to health care, and this is really looking at both the infrastructure um, available to people and then individual limitations to access. Uh, on insurance and healthcare costs. The fifth, fifth chapter will focus on disease and injury, which just will break, kind of break down the major um, chronic and acute, acute conditions that we see in our region. And then finally, we look at health across the life course, uh, which is, examines healthy behaviors and decision making that affects uh, people from birth into older age. So our report, um, the main challenge has been during this, this reporting process is to really balance three levels of analysis, both the regional focus, the county um, highlights that we see, and then state comparisons. So when counties differ, we really try to highlight the similarities within the region, and when they when the counties are dissimilar, we try to um, kind of give some background on why that might be and highlight those dissimilarities. And then we try to compare regional data to state data and use that as benchmarks um, for the region in comparison. And then we use the narrative to tie these three foci together and really guide the reader through the report. I'm sorry if I missed that. So who is funding this RHA? Yeah, so for the first year, it was funded by IHNCCO okay. um, solely, right? And then for the second year, it's split evenly between IHN and the three counties. And we're hoping that following cycles will include additional partners to kind of um, break up the cost. There's an understanding that 
not all partners would have the same funding available or the same level of needs that the counties and the CCO have. So one thing we're exploring is kind of different levels of involvement in terms of how much is contributed in and also how much is accessed. So for example, Samaritan Health Services has contracted with us this year to produce their health needs assessment. And so they uh, contracted directly with the regional health assessment, which defrayed the cost that was split among the counties <coughs> and the CCO. So how we actually constructed the report is we used um, public health theory, which includes our framework, um, which was a mix of map and grounded theory. Uh, background on which indicators uh, best describe the health of our region and guidance on when and how to highlight um, differences and similarities within those indicators. Um, we used data to create visuals where appropriate and then included um, data within the narrative as well. It may look like we just shook everything together and threw it into a report, but it's actually a lot more planned and complicated than that. <laughs> And Peter will talk a little bit about kind of the background um, work in creating some of the visuals. Yeah. Um, so we thought it would be a good opportunity to demonstrate some of what went into the report. Since it's your standard eight and a half by eleven PDF, it, and it's not done, we're not going to go through the whole thing there, and it doesn't really make sense to like pull a paragraph out because there's no context. But visuals can play that role. So here's an example of um, how we use those three components, theory, data, and visuals, to explore the race and ethnicity of the K-12 population in our region. Um, so theory tells us that uh, from a public health standpoint, changing demographics are really important. So we wanted to see, does the K-12 population have similar or different demographic profile with the whole, uh, the whole regional population from age zero to 100. So using the Oregon Department of Education online database, we downloaded um, a spreadsheet full of data on uh, proportion, proportionate demographic representation among public K-12 students. And we used that to collapse it down and make it, I guess, visually meaningful and accessible. So uh, we've got Benton County, Lincoln County, Lynn County, and the region for the numbers and the percents of each. And one example, one thing this will do is, is in our current report, we're using our regional numbers. But when the counties need their local shots, we have it right there for Benton County, Lynn County, and Lincoln County. And then with this data, we created our visual that goes into the report itself, which compares uh, in the solid is the total population demographic breakdown, and then the Crosshatched is the K-12, and so you can see that in general, while still mostly white, the K-12 population is more diverse in the region than the total population. Um, another example of theory, data, and visuals is the annual count of high temperature days. So in the environment chapter, I did a little reading about what's the best way to track what's the best data we can get for climate change? Because we wanted to be able to say something about climate change. And unfortunately, for a report at this level with my environmental science literacy and our readers' environmental science literacy, it didn't make sense to go and try to find Los Alamos model data of you know, predicted increase in prevalence of extreme weather events or something like that. We needed something tangible, concrete, and yet that still demonstrated that, yes, climate change is affecting our region. So um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has a set of weather stations all around the region that have been recording for a various number of years. Um, they, they make that all publicly available at Climate Data Online. It's a really nice searchable feature. You can use it um, by a map. You can put in the name of the place you're looking for. You can restrict years. So um, there were three stations that had data that went back at least to 1948. One in eastern Lynn County, Marion Folks Cachatchery, the um, High Slop Field Station up at the High Slop Research Area, and then a station in Otis, Lincoln County, which is just north of Lincoln City, right here in the top. 
So basically, um, I downloaded every day's maximum temperature for the last, since 1948, restricted it to May to September, because that's usually what's considered for high temperature days, and then put together graphs showing um, the trends over the last nearly 60 years. And so uh, with this, you know, we were able to take what was kind of a vague concept and say, yes, we are having increased temperatures. We're having a higher number on average of high temperature days each year. Still a lot of variation, but uh, so for example, in Lynn and Lincoln County, I believe it was every seven years, no, every three to four years, there was an extra day of temperatures above the 90th percentile. Um, and in Lynn County, it was still a significant increase, but that was every seven years, so it goes up only about half as fast, which of course we can explain because of the moderating influence of the ocean climate. Any questions about these visuals? Okay, let's see. So one other thing I wanted to talk about briefly is how we're keeping track of all this data. Um, now that we know we're going to be doing this every five years for a given service or given partner, and more often than that, we want to make sure we can do it quickly and easily in the future. So um, Miyuki, who downloaded a lot of data, and she's a current MPH student here, has been tracking everything that she's downloaded in um, basically a recipe, so next time we need to go for it, we can go and get it, and we can update it really easily. I probably should do a count of how many different data lines have gone into the report, but it, that would be time consuming. All right, um, I'm gonna turn it back to Ruby. Okay, so throughout this process and putting together the regional health assessment, there have been quite a few challenges, but there's also been a lot of um, opportunities as well. The first challenge being accommodating the different cycles and timelines of each partner. So each county has a five-year cycle that they have to report their chip on, but not just every <coughs> county started on the same year. So they're all on a five-year cycle, but they've started at different times. So their reporting is off a little bit. Um, again, the CCO has a five-year cycle, but it, again, started at a different time in the hospitals. So just being able to coordinate um, these different assessment cycles and making sure that we don't, we aren't um, using resources over and over and over again and having a central area, a central um, data warehouse where, where all of these partners can go and pull data when they need it um, is really important and kind of the cornerstone of this project. Next challenge or the next two challenges is meeting data and analysis needs of different partners and balancing regional focus on um, the county's needs for specificity and population health focus with partners' needs for data on some populations. So each um, partner, um, uh, particularly the three counties, have very different needs. We have a lot of the different geographic areas, um, different demographic makeups, um, so that's been challenging as well, Hi being able to highlight um, and really look at the differences across each county and then the different populations served by each county. So in Lincoln County, um, there's a, a much higher population of, of elderly residents, whereas in Benton County, the population is a lot younger. One of the last challenges was dealing with gaps in local public health data. If you look down to the bottom of our opportunities list, that's also um, a really great opportunity for us and our partners to be able to identify those gaps and find ways and to uh, meet those needs. And moving on to opportunities, um, it's been a really <coughs> important process in creating a platform for accessible data, as we've talked about throughout the presentation, and the dyna dynamic visuals and maps that um, have been created during the process and can be used across Using data to generate analyzable questions about the health of the region has been um, a really important piece of this project and kind of a um, 
something that we really have been trying to champion as we go out to the community and partners and talk about this project is, is having um, <coughs> data to be able to visualize and, and conceptualize the health needs of our community has been invaluable. And then eliminating redundancy, as we mentioned, among different health system entities and their reporting cycles has been really important. And strengthening regional partnerships and community health, because it's really um, going to be the efforts made across partners um, and the collaboration that goes on that will strengthen the community health of our region rather than each partner working independently in their in their locations. Yes. So in the warehouse from which you're pulling the data, is it um, aggregated data like population statistics? Do you, you have any personal level uh, data in there and then what are you doing with identifiers and um, uh, privacy and yeah. all of that? So we don't have any identifiable information. It's all been um, aggregated at uh, some level. Okay. So for example, census data um, or the like the ODE report, the Oregon Department of Education report, it just gives us what the numbers and the percents are. So that's the kind of data we're doing. Thank you. Yeah. And that is the majority of our Yeah, that's our, kind of our regional health assessment. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah. So how much were the gaps? How much primary data collection goes on at the Chaw or the Raw? Any? So we actually are doing some um, primary data collection with the hospitals, uh, Samaritan hospitals this year. And so we've developed a community health perception survey, and that will go out hopefully starting the beginning of December through February. Um, and that will be their, actually that along with focus groups that they're doing and key informant interviews that Samaritan is performing, that will be the primary data source within their reports. And we actually have um, a sign-up sheet if anybody is interested in taking the survey or helping us um, disseminate the survey, whether it's in your class or on your listserv, um, then we'd love other help. Yeah, so at the end, we'll, um, if you want to come up, you know, name an email, and then probably, certainly within a month, we'll have the survey ready on Survey Marquee, and then we'll send you an email like, with the link if you want to help us out. We'll have it in uh, English and Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. So is the hope that all these organizations that need to do community needs assessments, like you didn't have Oregon Head Start Pre-Kindergarten Program, but every three years, I think, they have to do uh, needs assessments. So there are a lot of people who have to do community needs assessments. Is your hope that... Um, you're creating um, a sustained data collection effort that would enable any partner to use this data to create a county or region specific needs assessment? Yep, that's exactly our goal. Yeah. So part of it will be us leveraging economies of scale to get a lot of the data that, the broader data that, um, say, Head Start means, like, a party rates among children or something. And then Head Start, which collects its own data, hopefully would feed their data to us, and then it kind of be stored centrally and um, available to available others to them, and also to Early Learning Hub, and also to the CCO. Yeah, that's really the, the goal. Yeah. Have you had any challenges, like, getting access data from, like, Samaritan? That's a good question. Uh, yes and no. No in that we haven't pushed them on it. Yes in that they didn't come and say, look at all this data we have to use. Right now we've been focusing on data that's basically available to anybody online. What is slash will be the availability to the public of um, these sort of assessments? As far as the assessments go, they're always publicly available. Um, as far as the data goes, when it's publicly available data, 
if we had to do a lot of work to get it all aligned, we're probably not going to just have it in a easily or a free online lookup feature. Um, it's probably going to be on an internal server that all of our partners can access. But this regional health assessment, it will be published on the county websites and the CCO. The Benton County, or each county, CHAW and CHIP, and the CCO's CHAW and CHIP are available on their respective websites. Yes? Have you guys started identifying kind of priority issues from collecting all this data? That's a great question. Um, so each of the counties have identified priority issues from their 2012-2013 CHAWs. So, Is there a lot of overlap between what the counties are thinking about? Um, there's some overlap, yeah. By and large, five to seven in each county, probably two of those are likely to be found in any county. <coughs> and then the CCO had their priorities, which are focused on the members. Again, a fair amount of overlap. So one of the goals, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. All right, so one of the goals is, if everybody's working from the same data set, maybe it's more likely that the priorities will be the same as well. I, may, I might have missed it, but I was just wondering how many other CCOs throughout the state are doing similar things. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there are something like 23 CCOs in all. They all have a requirement to participate in a community health assessment and to create a chip with the community advisory council. As far as partnering with um, a county or a region to kind of do a central data set that everybody's using equally, that hasn't happened yet. Partly, I would say it's because, for example, there's a bunch of CCOs in Multnomah County. Um, there's one CCO for most of Eastern Oregon. So we're fortunate in that um, these counties and the CCO fit together. I know that Lane County and Trillium CCO are working closely together because they're basically a complete overlap. So it makes perfect sense for them to work together to find a lot of extra barriers. Yeah? Are you picking up housing? Is um, data in the data question. warehouse? Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to leave that into just a couple of examples of the analyses we've been able to do since we started the regional data. And I'll start with housing. So, um, I read an article recently about ways to look at housing costs. There's the census reported information, which is uh, percent or the proportion of the population that pays more than 30% of their income on housing. And another measure is residual income after housing. So it just looks at the amount of money you have in your pocket after you pay your housing, whether it was 10% of your income or 30, 50% of your income. So that got me thinking, and so, um, I, uh, I did the residual housing information. So you take the median income here, it's in census tracts. Take the median income and take the median housing costs and you subtract and you look at what's left over. So um, Lynn County has a really great geographic information systems department. And so I got the data, put it together and sent it over to Steve there and he created this map for us, which is at the tract level and it has uh, quartiles of residual income after housing. Darker is worse, lighter is better for all of these maps. So in this case, the darkest region is between $3,500 and $27,000 annual income after you pay your housing costs. So if you look kind of overall at the region, it's darker near cities, it tends to be lighter in rural areas mostly because housing costs are lower. Then if you zoom in and look at Newport, Corvallis, and Albany, you see it kind of fits that train as well. The closer you get to the middle of the city, the less residual income there is. Um, Lincoln County, having a regional look is helpful because if you only looked at Lincoln County, your quartiles would be different and these guys might not stand out as much. But even though they're rural, they still have less residual income than rural areas in, in Benton counties. And then one question I had was, what about housing inequality? Is there a difference if you own versus if you rent? So the next map 
it takes residual income for homeowners, separates residual income from renters, and then does a ratio. So ideally, the ratio would be one. Doesn't matter whether you own or rent, your average residual income is the same. Bigger numbers mean owners have more residual income than renters. And so if you look, you see, if anything, more striking. Urban areas have more housing inequality than rural areas. And this red um, region right here says that an owner in that census tract in Corvallis, that's downtown Corvallis, has 31 times the residual income than and it's not that there's one homeowner there who's super rich. It's like 33% of residents there are owners, 66% are renters. Um, down here in the campus area, it's similar. In fact, most of Corvallis, there's four to 12 times the residual income for owners versus renters. So this, I mean, I think this is kind of the main advantage is, um, as far as the regional health assessment goes, my work is to make the report, and then I'll stumble across something like this, and it'll pique my interest, and we've got the data there. Um, this I kind of came up with myself, but um, for example, the Benton County Food Security Work Group asked me to talk a little bit about SNAP utilization. So I had all this data at hand. I was able to put together a presentation looking at SNAP utilization rates. Um, this is a histogram of the proportion of households receiving SNAP across the region. So uh, the goal here was to compare all households on the top with households that have children. The horizontal scales are the same. So you can see that. Um, the average proportion of households in a census tract receiving SNAP is between 15 and 20 percent of those households. But if you look at households with children, the average is between 30 and 40 percent. And if you look at the tail of the distribution, there's quite a lot of census tracts out here where households with children have a lot of SNAP utilization versus all households in general. And that got me thinking about, well, I had read, and I don't have necessarily a public health background, but I had read that uh, families headed by a single person tend to have um, higher SNAP utilization rates. And I wondered, is that true in our region? So this is a scatter plot. This is the proportion of families in a census tract that have children and are headed by a single parent, going from no families all the way to 70%. And this is the proportion of households with children receiving SNAP, going from no families all the way to 60%, with a really strong uh, positive association. An increase in 1% in terms of single parent gives you three quarters of a percent in terms of SNAP benefits. The other nice thing is, not only do we look at the whole region, but the color coding relates to the counties. And so in this case, it looks kind of like it doesn't matter what county you live in. It affects all of the counties equally. Um, and that got me thinking. I think I have one Because <laughs> what this, the SNAP, the food group really wanted to know is not just who's using SNAP, but if they're eligible, are they using it? There's no question that I'm aware of that's asking, are you eligible, but are you getting it or not? The census finds out if they're using it, but they don't ask if they're eligible. One of the things that work group is doing is they want to start a survey to determine utilization rates. Um, but you can get a, an approximate measure of that just by looking at poverty levels. So this is a scatter plot of um, using 138% of poverty as a proxy for eligibility for SNAP. So the proportion of families with eligibility for SNAP versus the proportion of families using SNAP. You like to see every dot on the 45 degree line showing full utilization. Why are these dots up above here? That doesn't make sense. That's measurement error. It's, you expect some sort of spread. And the fact that most of these dots are below the 45 degree line and some are very far below the 45 degree line shows that there's not a lot of utilization in a lot of areas. And once again, when you look at counties, you start looking at 
Well, Benton County, a lot of, there are four tracks with a lot of eligibility and very low utilization. What's that about? I couldn't map this one, so I don't know which tracks they are. I always want to make this students. Yeah, I could look it up in terms of the numbers and do it, but um, since this was county specific, I didn't have a chance to ask the Lynn County guy to put a map together. It's like they asked me one day and two days later I had to talk about it. Um, I could it, could it be um, presence of children in the households and Benton County having so many um, households without children in low income because of their, our student status? Mm -hmm. I mean, could that explain why we had so many blue dots? I'm honestly not sure. Most of my exploration is, uh, I see this hypothesis generating which I think is great. That's that's what I feel my role is, to show people some data that's not going to answer questions, but maybe it, it directs them to ask a particular question. Um, okay, uh, I think we're short on time. Is that right? Are we at a time to It's a great show. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. I we're here till 12. Okay, well, if you guys don't mind, I'd love to show you some of the work. <laughs> that the Early Learning Hub has been doing. So um, they get uh, kindergarten readiness scores from the state. Every child who enters a public kindergarten does an assessment uh, that involves approaches to learning, which is self-regulation and um, interpersonal skills, I think. And then some academic measures, which is math and two literacy scores. And um, there's been research saying that the best predictor of kindergarten readiness is the percent of students in a school uh, who are eligible for free and reduced lunch as a proxy for income, as a proxy for kindergartners, as a proxy for family families with kindergarten knowledge. It's not great, but it's the best predictor. And so I wondered if that holds true for our region. So the horizontal axis is the percent of students at an elementary school eligible for free or reduced lunch um, going from maybe 5% up to 95%. And then the vertical is a standardized uh, approaches to learning social skills score. And I didn't find any association between um, eligibility for free and reduced lunch and approaches to learning in our particular region, which um, I find heartening, I guess. It's, you know, you can't say that if you come from a region with more families economic hardship that in general kids aren't going to be doing as well socially. What I found that was interesting, well the other thing I found was that there was an association for math and literacy. The more students eligible for free and reduced lunch, the lower the average math and literacy scores at a given school. So these now, these dots represent schools, not census tracts. And again, they're color coded to county. Um, so I thought it was interesting that the social skills didn't seem to have a strong association, but the math and learning did have a strong association. And um, I started this exploration just by looking at those two dimensions, social and academic. And uh, I did a, a cluster analysis seeing if there were schools that were similar based on those scores. Um, I don't know if any of you have done or seen a cluster analysis. It's like a gene tree, basically. So there are a couple interesting things, and I know this is too far away for you guys to see. Again, color-coded. So a lot of the blue schools are over here. Now, left to right doesn't mean anything in terms of quality. It's just a clustering. Kings Valley, Franklin, and Muddy Creek, the three elective elementary schools are very similar to each other. And then way over here is Eddyville Charter, which branches so early that it must be really different from all the other schools. So if you scatter plot those, sure enough, there's something way down here that seems a lot different from the other. But in general, it's a pretty nice spread. It's, there's not a strong association. Higher math and literacy doesn't automatically mean higher social skills or vice versa, or lower. And here are those three main branches so if you look at the tree, you and I just looked at three branches. There's one for Eddyville. There's a really big one here, and then the smaller one there. And if you look at how they're grouped, 
you can kind of see how the statistical program thought they were associated. So what are the x and y axis for this graph? That's good. I forgot to say that. Sorry. So the x axis is standardized social skills that coaches to learn. The y axis is standardized math and literacy skills. So the value doesn't tell us anything. It's just if you're farther here, you have stronger social skills. If you're higher, you have stronger math and literacy. Bend County schools tend to have very strong math and literacy, but not stronger or weaker on approaches to learning social skills. Um, so um, Alicia just left, but she's um, they're just finishing a paper using kindergarten assessment scores, and she would have to describe it. But the thing, when I heard her report, um, that was the strongest was kind of all the variation got sucked up at the school building level, mm -hmm. uh, not district, n not um, county, but uh, the so, got to, I'm sorry, which level did it? School. The school, school level. building, elementary school okay. building level okay. was where the, where they found the very, now, I should never, I, I was, if she just was sitting right there and I was hoping she was going to say it, you know, so to get it really straight, you'd have to talk to her, but it might be interesting mm -hmm. for you to connect with Alicia because it's a very similar, um, Look, it has a lot of implications for the early learning hubs yeah. because um, if that's if we're if it's that localized, yeah. it's pretty clear where to put your resources. Yeah. <laughs> so I so this kind of analysis is really important. Has a lot of policy implications and can really help us reach the kids who need it, the families, because this is all about supporting children before they get to school. Right. You, you take this test, this assessment happens in the first three weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the early years. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much.